Roll call. I'm Chair Lanza. I'm here. Andrew? Here. Sunita? Recording in progress. Sunita, are you here? Sunita's not here. Um, Howard? Present. Great, thanks, Howard. Eshvar? Not present. Are you are you on the road, Eshvar? Where are you calling in from? Uh, I'm in Mumbai, India, so... <laughs> That's right, that's halfway around the world, brother. <laughs> uh, it, it is, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Dick? Yes. Uh, Frank? Uh, this is Dave. Frank is going to be lady stuck in traffic. Thanks a lot, Dave. Dave, you're here, and uh, we have a vacancy. So we have a quorum. Uh, let's go through the agenda. Okay, we have, we have no closed session, right, Roberto? That's, that's correct, no closed session. All right, so then I'll move right on um, to the orders of the day, which I have here in front of me. Um, reminder uh, to everyone that we're on Zoom, so there's a slightly different protocol. Most times we'll leave the floor open. It hasn't been necessary in the past to, um, hang on, to, shut, it, to shut the floor down and go do roll call. Uh, we'll do that when I deem it necessary. In any case, on weighty matters, like some of the stuff we're hearing from the actor today, we'll do a proper round robin to make sure that everybody gets heard. Um, remind everyone, uh, and Maytac uh, is here or will be, um, the, the geniuses in Sacramento and the brilliance of their, of their declining wisdom has decided that every meeting, uh, we need to have a vote related to uh, Zoom calls as we're continuing to do so. So everybody stick around after the meeting. Uh, let's see what else we get here. Kept, um, okay, and now we've got um, to wave sunshine. Um, can we can I get a motion to wave sunshine on four C two four G and seven point two F? So moved by Santos. Got a motion by Santos. Do I have a second? Second, Gardenier. Got a motion by Santos. Second by Gardenier. Uh, let's go around and vote. Andrew. Aye. Uh, Sunita. Yeah, I. Oh, thanks, Sunita. Uh, and that, that by the way, means Sunita's here. Sorry, <laughs> I'm really late. Yeah. It's fine. Howard? Yes. And Eshwar? Aye. Can't resist. Mumbai votes aye. And, uh, <laughs> Dick. <laughs> Dick, can you vote aye? Yes. Great. Franco, are you here yet? Not yet. Okay, that's fine. Dave, how do you vote? Aye. Uh, I'm Chair Lanz. I vote aye. I'll note again for the record we have a vacancy uh, on the uh, public side. All right, let's see. We're scrolling right along here. Uh, does anyone want to pull anything off the consent calendar? Okay. It's pretty straightforward. If not, do I have a motion to approve the consent calendar? So move, Santos. I have a motion by Santos, so I have a second. Gardner, second. I have a motion by Santos, second by Gardner to approve the consent calendar. Uh, Andrew, how do you vote? Aye. Benita, how do you vote? Aye. Howard, how do you vote? Yes. Ashfar, how do you vote? Aye. Okay, Mumbai votes aye. This is never going to get old. <laughs> <laughs> Dick, how do you vote? <laughs> yes. Uh, Franco, you're not here yet. Um, Dave, how do you vote? Aye. I'm Chair Lanza. I vote aye. And again, for the record, we have vacancy on the public side. Guys, we're going to be we're going to be done in record time if we keep up this pace. Um, we'll do um, over to you, Prabhu, and then Ray will have you jump in right after Prabhu. So, overall update. Go ahead, Prabhu. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have no uh, formal agenda items this uh, morning, but I do have some performance numbers, uh, which I'd like to share with the board. And then I'm always, as always, happy to take questions. So this is from Makita. Uh, and as of November 2nd, fiscal year to date, the pension is up 3.79% and healthcare is up 2%. Because these are estimates and these are unaudited numbers. Um, but they do give some indication of how our plans are doing. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm happy to take any questions from board members. 
Uh, let, let me ask the first one, then we'll explore. How, how, how is that compared to our peers? Is everyone roughly performing like that? Uh, we don't have peer information yet, um, but I, I don't know if Laura is on call and if she has an, an, an idea, but I, I would assume so, given that our risk levels are somewhere in the, in the middle of, our, of the pack compared to our peers. Roughly off the top of your head, Prabhu, how would a 60-40 portfolio have done to date, roughly? Um, single did, low single digits, mid single digits? Yeah, yeah. About, I, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Laura. Sorry, I'm looking it up right now. And to date, you mean since um, June 30th? Uh, let me see here. So... We look at things um, uh, often, you know, month to date, quarter to date. So in, since the end of um, September, a 60-40 global portfolio would have been up 3.6%. Um, we had some, some weakness in September. Um, a year to date, so since January 1st, 60-40 portfolio would have been up 9%. So we're probably looking at, um, you know, it's definitely a positive return. Um, unfortunately, we don't have peer information yet, but uh, but we'll keep you posted. That's super helpful, Laura. That answers my question. Thanks. Uh, floor is open. Anybody have any questions? Going once, going twice. Thanks, Prabhu. Um, Andrew, I know you and Ray, I don't know if you want to kick off uh, Ray, the discussion. I know you and Ray working on, on this project together. So, yeah, uh, um, We've uh, had a couple discussions um, last two meetings um, in regards to this item. Um, Ray uh, is um, spearheading an effort to um, try and um, get um, mental health care or EAP um, benefits extended to retirees. Um, as an active employee, um, all, um, all employees have access to AP, EAP, but once we um, retire, uh, those benefits go away. Um, Ray has laid out in a, in, uh, which is attached here um, in our board packet, um, an explanation of the importance behind this and um, with statistics of how numbers are suffering um, in, in retirement. Um, Ray has asked the board um, for a couple things from, from us and in one of them last meeting was uh, for us to, if when he goes to the city and speaks to city council, that if the city comes to us requesting um, access to Chiron to run some numbers, that uh, we would be in support. Um, and we last meeting um, uh, gave a verbal, yeah, we would be in agreement with that. Um, and we then took it one step further and provided a letter to the city. Um, saying that we we support their efforts, uh, which is attached um, in this uh, in our board packet. Um, so for this agenda item, it is more um, for us to approve the letter uh, that has been um, written that we will provide uh, to city council and be part of the the overall um, packet. Ray, do you have anything else you want to add? No, I I read the letter. Thank you very much. The letter is uh, written very well and much appreciated. So, you know, one, one of the things that it was mentioned in the letter and we've touched, we've discussed in, in past meetings was, uh, you know, there is a, there's a divide, uh, a line drawn between, you know, our roles and responsibility as uh, fiduciaries. And, and one of the things that we want to make sure we are, we don't do is that we are um, not um, uh, crossing the line and advocating um, for benefit enhancements or um, removal of benefits. That's not our, our job. Um, start talking with uh, council. Council is, um, is comfortable uh, with showing support um, for an effort, and that is what we are doing here. Um, so if everybody is uh, okay with this letter, um, we'll just need to a, um, get a motion and approval um, by all the trustees. And I would make the first, go ahead and make the first motion to um, approve this letter. I'll make a second. This is Santos, but I'd like to have a, a moment with uh, speaking on this, Mr. Chair. Um, sure, I have a motion uh, by Gardner and uh, second by Santos. Floor is open for discussion. Before you go, Dick, is, is Harvey on the call yet? 
No, Harvey's not, he won't be joining until uh, later in the meeting. I'm oh, but you're, on, you're on great, Maytech. Go ahead, Dick, and I'll turn over to you, Maytech, after Dick. Well, just a small comment is that, yes, I understand we cannot be advocating for benefits, but at the same time, we have a fiduciary responsibility protecting the plan. And when people are healthy and can live longer, uh, this is helpful uh, to many. And I believe that's just part of protecting the plan. So that's just a comment. It's not because of the numbers are going up. Uh, this was needed for years ago. It's just starting to surface way too often. And it's with such sadness because uh, what it causes so much uh, harm and grief to so many. And um, I happen to unfortunately be close to a couple of people that, and that's just numbers. If it's one, it's one too many. So. Uh, it's not just sympathy, it's trying to be understanding, and just like myself. And during my time, you couldn't have, uh, you know, we got drafted, we went in unjust wars, and then my brother went in after me. We didn't get uh, to stay home, and today he has all the symptoms of the effects of war, and uh, the country's not doing much for him. Uh, he doesn't want money, he just wants to be taken care of. So. I have had this in my occupation as an army veteran and also as a fire service working with the police and fire. So this has been so neglected for so long and we need to help. So thank you. Uh, thanks to four of the four rest of trustees. Maytag, can you just give us a minute or two on, on as Andrew says, when we cross the line of, of our fiduciary duty and when we're in fair bounds on a letter like this? So in terms of the fair bounds in a letter like this, the most we can ask for the city council is that they consider um, the request and that the request uh, weighs on our membership in a certain way. Um, so we speak on the behalf of our members in terms of the impact on our members for their consideration of the issue. Now, in terms of what Andrew was saying, advocating for benefits, the crossing the line would be, we want these benefits. Our members definitely need these benefits and that we, we are requesting that they provide those benefits. So that's where the line is. We have to respect the city council's um, authority on this matter, as well as uh, reserve our, respect our role as well in terms of our membership's um, best interests. Great. So then I just was rereading this short letter while you're speaking. So we're well within bounds um, in this letter. Correct. So at, at most in this letter, what we're requesting is that we're requesting that the city council consider the impacts that will, it will have on our membership. We do not go as far as to say we are demanding that these benefits be provided. That, that's great. All right. The floor is open. Anybody else wants to weigh in before I, I call for the vote? All right, I, I'll call for the vote now. I'll note for the record, I see that Franco's um, out there, so you'll hear his name shortly. Um, Andrew, how do you vote? Aye. Sunita, how do you vote? Aye. Oh, Power Drew, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't get someone to second the motion. I wasn't sure. If Dick Sandy, it was motion by Gardner, second by Santos. Okay, thank you. No, no worries. Sunita, you voted aye? Yeah, I thought the letter was very well written. Thank you, Drew. Yeah. Uh, Thanks, thanks, Andrew and Ray, for working so close to the end and really doing a good job on this. Uh, Howard, how do you vote? Yes. Far, how do you vote? Aye. An eye from Mumbai. Uh, Dick, how do you vote? Yes. Franco, how do you vote? Aye. Dave, how do you vote? Aye. I'm Chair Lanza. I vote aye. Uh, let the record reflect uh, Maytac. And it, if somebody wanted to add a short line to the to the mail, I'm sure it would be okay to note that the board voted unanimously uh, in favor of this. Sure, we'll All add right. That. Oh yeah, thanks. Uh, let's see where we are. Um, oh right, so on to the um, I, items three actuarial stuff. Um, hey Roberto, I know there were some uh, emails bouncing around about sort of combining. Chiron's presentation, where'd we end up on all that? Yes, thank you, Drew. So uh, just as I know, we just completed a discussion and action on item 3B. The emails were uh, about combining 3A and 4C. And the reason for that, Drew, is because you may recall that uh, Chiron did present their economic assumptions, recommendations at your last meeting. 
and your board elected to uh, defer uh, action to this meeting. So what they are doing this morning is they have uh, a presentation of 4C, which is a sort of a combination of recommendations for the economic assumptions, and then also sharing with the board the results of the uh, biannual experience study so that you can also take action on the demo demographic assumptions. Uh, Bill, are you there? Yes, I can see you are. Bill, raise his hand. Um, is that correct? Is there anything else you want to mention? No, that, that's correct. Our, um, our presentation under 4C uh, combined the continuation of the economic assumptions with the demographic. And so taking them together uh, would be very helpful. So bottom line is, uh, Mr. Chair, so it, it, it will be fine and I would recommend to the board to take and uh, both items 3A and 4 and 4C um, um, together and you can take action at, at that point. Do you want to delay them to 4C or do you want to do them now, Roberto? What works best uh, for all of us? Yeah, no, we, um, let's do it now and then we can go back to the aura updates uh, later. So let's, let's, if you want, let's jump to it now. Great. All right, Bill, over to you. Oh, ex excuse me, Mr. Chair. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Linda. What's up? Ray Storms has his hand up. We'll go. I thanks. Uh, what's up, Ray? I just want to thank the board uh, for taking the time to look into this issue and writing a letter. It's really, really appreciated. So thank you all for the time and effort. Well, and I Ray, let me email. go ahead, hey, Ray. Let me thank you on behalf of the board for acting uh, so professionally and working so closely with uh, Gardner. It made the whole job really easy. Appreciate it, Ray. You're welcome. You guys have a good day. You too, Ray. Bye. All right, over to you, Bill and Ann. Okay, uh, let me share my screen here. Okay, so uh, the item that was attached to 3A was just our presentation from the last board meeting. So uh, I'm not planning to review that, um, but certainly can refer to it for any questions that uh, you may have, because there's more detail in that presentation. Hey, Bill, uh, right, Bill let me jump in. Refresh the board's memory. Why do, I forget it was a month ago. Why did we delay this by one month? What was our thinking? Uh, I think the uh, board had not decided uh, what discount rate they wanted to go with. Uh, and so we'll go through that ag again and tee up that discussion at the end here. Great, thanks, Bill. So uh, just as a reminder of where we are in our schedule of actuarial presentations, uh, last month we presented the economic assumptions. This month we're presenting the demographic experience study and then trying to get final decisions on uh, both the economic and demographic assumptions or the, the pension plan. We'll be back in December with uh, the initial pension valuation results and starting to talk about OPEB assumptions and get decisions on, on those. Uh, in January, we expect that Siegel will be able to present their audit results. They're auditing our uh, valuation this year. Uh, and at that point, we will finalize the, the valuation report. And at the same time, provide the draft OPEB results. And then in February, we'll wrap everything up with Siegel's audit of our OPEB valuation and our final OPEB valuation report. So at the October meeting, uh, we reviewed the economic assumptions. We recommended a potential change to the discount rate and had uh, three alternatives for the board to, to consider. Uh, we did not recommend any other changes uh, to any of the other assumptions. And so the, those decisions will come back to that at the uh, end of this presentation uh, after we talk about the demographic assumptions. So every two years, uh, we have to review all of the demographic assumptions and we uh, collect data and compare actual experience to what we had assumed. 
and then make any adjustments that are needed. Because we do this every two years, uh, there's um, not a whole lot that changes between them. So we've been doing this for a while. We've got the assumptions uh, pretty much uh, where the experience has been. Uh, and there are just some minor uh, tweaks that, that come up now. So, Mr. Chair, can I ask a, a quick question? Yeah, floor is generally over. Go ahead, jump in anybody, anytime. Go ahead, Roberto. Bill, a quick question, and maybe I asked this before and you have explained it. Um, do, can you remind the board why do we do this experience every two years? Uh, because it seems fairly often compared to my experience. So can you, can you comment on that? Yeah, so for most systems, we see it done every three to five years. Uh, the, um, the county systems in California are required to do it every three years. I think uh, CalPERS does theirs every four years uh, and CalSTRS in San Francisco, I think every five years. And that's kind of the typical uh, range, um, but the San Jose Municipal Code requires us to do this one every two years. Um, so I know the state of Oregon also requires it every two years, uh, and there may be a few others, but uh, this is much more frequent than normal. Oh, understood. Well, thank you very much for that reminder. I know federated is every four years, yeah, we set federated does not have it in the municipal code. So um, we set the um, period at every four years. Right, thank you. Uh, so this year uh, we're proposing one of our normal updates is uh, we have a mortality projection scale and that uh, the scale we use gets updated every year by the Society of Actuaries. And so when we do this every two years, we normally update to the most recent uh, scale that was released. Uh, and they just, and they release it mid-October. So they've just released uh, this new scale, MP 2021. Uh, so we're recommending that we update to that. Uh, the other mortality change uh, is a change to the beneficiary table. We had been using a table from CalPERS from a couple experience studies ago of theirs, and uh, we're recommending updating to uh, a, the general uh, public uh, mortality table done by the Society of Actuaries. It's called 2010 because that's the central date of their experience, but it was uh, as I recall, it was released in 2019. So it's a fairly recent table. Uh, we saw some uh, continuation of trends we'd seen before in the merit salary scale. Uh, so we're making some continued adjustments to get closer to that experience. Uh, we're not making any, suggesting any changes for most of the other assumptions uh, with just a slight reduction in the assumed uh, expenses, administrative expenses. So uh, the, there's a, the second attachment to this item is our full experience study report. It goes through the analysis on all of these assumptions and shows why we're not recommending any changes. For the presentation, I'm just going to talk about uh, where we are suggesting changes, but we can take questions on any of the other assumptions uh, if, if you like. So um, as actuaries, there have been two topics we talk about this year. Uh, one has been the exceptional investment returns and what that's provided. And the second has been mortality and in what the impact of COVID has been on mortality experience. Uh, the chart on the left here is from a study done by the Society of Actuaries on uh, excess uh, mortality in the US. This is across the entire US population. And the red bars show the excess mortality due to COVID. 
uh, and this is just through 2020, so it doesn't cover uh, the um, experience in 2021. It's calendar year 2020. Um, but you can see uh, over all ages, there was about a 17% increase due to COVID deaths. And as you might expect, uh, at the older ages, the impact was greater than at the younger ages. The surprising thing was the excess deaths uh, not related to COVID, which are represented by the gray bars. Uh, and in fact, the highest increase in mortality uh, during 2020 was for the age 35 to 64 age group, when you bring in the, the excess non-COVID deaths. So there's a lot of research going into what, <laughs> what's caused those excess non-COVID deaths. Um, and just as a preliminary um, piece, I took uh, some data that uh, was presented in the uh, Journal of the American Medical Association based on CDC data on causes of death and comparing 2020 non-COVID causes to the average for those causes for the prior three years. And you can see um, kind of increases uh, in, in most categories. Uh, the heart disease accounts for a huge number of deaths, so the 5.6% increase there is quite significant. Um, but you also see increased accidents here, includes drug overdoses, and so that's um, been up significantly. Um, strokes, Alzheimer's, diabetes are, are all up significantly uh, in 2020. The Society of Actuaries uh, published this chart recently uh, showing an update in 2021 of excess deaths uh, by week. And you can see the pattern does uh, follow sort of our experience with the COVID waves uh, of the pandemic, where it was very high uh, in the spring, came down uh, through the summer, and then ticked up again uh, in the, the late summer and early fall. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is all of this information is on the US population as a whole. Uh, the impact has varied quite significantly by community. It's not uniform at all. And uh, the information for public pension plans across the country is just emerging. Uh, but the impact really that I've seen from the plans uh, that have released information has been much lower than the U.S. as a whole. Uh, Bill, if I could just uh, ask you a quick question on the previous chart. Sure. I uh, just want to clarify. So if you look at the age group 35 to 64, um, so the total increase in mortality is 26.7%. Right. And only less than half of that seemed to be COVID. Um, yeah. Okay, that's a big number, isn't it? I mean, it is. Uh, although, if you're looking at number of deaths, uh, it's still uh, heavily weighted towards the older population. Um, but in terms okay. of the, right. the rate of more the 35 to 64 was uh, a very large increase. And I found that very surprising. Right. OK, thank you. So um, this plan uh, is relatively small. Uh, and so we don't necessarily uh, see the impacts of these swings as easily. Um, to separate from the, the random noise, but we thought we'd look at what actual deaths we saw in the police and fire plan during 2021 compared to what we expected. And so the, the black square in the center here is the number of deaths we expected in among retirees 
disabled retirees and beneficiaries. And the gold diamond is what we actually experience. The gray bar is just the uh, confidence interval around the black squares based on the amount of experience we have. So it would only be if the actual experience was outside the gray bars that we could say um, that there was something going on. And so you can see all of our experience is within the gray bars. For retirees, it's actually lower than uh, what we expected. So there, there may be some impacts on our plan uh, due to the COVID pandemic, uh, but they weren't statistically significant enough for us to detect in this, in this year. So uh, going into our uh, proposals, we're proposing updating uh, from the MP 2019 mortality improvement scale to the 2021 scale. The 2021 scale, we should note, is, um, does not have any COVID-19 data in it. Uh, it's based on social security data through 2016, and then they piece on some CDC and Census Bureau and Medicare data for the last three years so that they have preliminary data through 2019, but none of that touches the COVID pandemic. Um, so the current thought is that once the uh, pandemic ends, we would return to mortality improvement uh, levels that we've seen pre-pandemic. And so we're not um, adjusting assumptions at this point in time uh, for COVID even though it clearly disrupted the pattern of mortality improvement uh, for 2020 and 2021. So um, we're suggesting that we just adopt the MP 2021 scale with no uh, adjustments to it uh, and then continue to monitor. And it's not clear at all what the Society of Actuaries is gonna do uh, over the next couple of years as they bring in um, the COVID data into their model for projecting mortality improvement. I should say also, um, this is not a big change between 2019 and 2021. Um, from 2019 to 2020, the improvement went down and then from 2020 to 2021 it went up. I think 2021 is slightly lower than 2019, but uh, they're very close. Uh, for beneficiaries, uh, we're showing the uh, rates of mortality here in the in the black squares are what we experienced. Uh, the red line is the current assumption. The green line is the proposed assumption. You can see there's um, just a, a minor difference, really, uh, and it's just shifting to a more updated mortality table. Uh, and we would, we'll be looking at this every couple of years, but this is just a, a minor tweak to that assumption. So with that, I'll turn it to Ann to go through the other uh, assumption changes. Are you on mute, Ann? I should have a quick question, Bill, before you go to the next one. Sure. Um, so if the data uh, in 2021 continues to uh, show the impact of, uh, and disproportionate impact of COVID, um, would it materially impact the plan if we don't review that for a couple of years? Uh, so <laughs> the, it depends on whether you think COVID has a long-term impact on mortality or just affects uh, mortality during the pandemic. 
and, and I don't think we know the answer to that yet. Um, but if it's just affecting the mortality during the pandemic, that has a very minor impact on the cost of the plan. If it has a long-term uh, impact, then that could uh, have a more significant impact reducing the cost of the plan. And so you won't know that long-term impact for a couple of more years, is that? That's that correct. So we, we're not losing much by re, re, by waiting another two years to see whether that long-term impact is, is there or not. Yeah, we'll probably have to wait longer than two years, uh, but we'll review what uh, information there is in two years on that. And uh, I know there are a lot of people looking at it, but um, I don't, I don't expect that we will really know what the long-term health uh, and longevity impacts are for COVID for, for a number of years. Understood, thanks a lot. Okay, Anne. Okay, hello everyone. Um, I'm going to be uh, going over the other two demographic assumptions that we are proposing some changes to, um, and then looking at uh, recapping the October meeting with the economic assumptions uh, and looking at uh, discount rate options, and then lo also looking at those cost impacts of our proposed changes. So here um, we're looking at our merit salary increase experience, and this is in addition to uh, the, the overall wage inflation assumption of 3%. So these are things like uh, longevity and step increases for the members. Um, you can see that the actual uh, blue line uh, represents the actual experience that we're seeing over the last 10 years or so. Um, and then the current assumption is this red line. And the actual rates, merit increase rates in the earlier years um, is higher than what we're, uh, our current assumptions are. And then it flip-flops where for service over six years, the actual experience uh, rates are a little bit lower. So this is the continued trend that we were seeing also from the 2019 experience study. So we're just proposing that we adjust those rates uh, closer to the actual experience, which is represented by that green, um, the green line to coming to closer to what uh, the actual experience uh, has been. And then ultimately, um, we are seeing slightly higher merit increases uh, later on in, in someone's career, uh, 10 years plus. So we're, we're gonna just slightly adjust those increases from 50 basis points to 60 basis points and continue to monitor uh, this experience in the next experience study as well. Moving on to the administrative expenses. Um, this, uh, is the last demographic assumption change that we're proposing that we make. And it's again, just a very slight uh, tweak to this assumption. We are seeing uh, that we are incurring administrative expenses slightly lower than in the past. Um, and the basis and structure of this assumption is that we look at it on a participant headcount basis so that we can allocate these administrative expenses between police and fire and tier one and tier two. So we're looking at the, his, the history of the last three years uh, and we adjust that uh, expense per member uh, for wage inflation. Um, and looking at that, the three-year average is about uh, $1,334 per member. And the current assumption is just slightly higher at uh, $1,355. So we're proposing that we slightly reduce that assumption. And in aggregate, that translates to going from a current assumption of about $6.1 million to about $6 million. So again, very, very slight change with little cost impact. So moving on to a recap of the October meeting where we uh, discussed economic assumptions. Um, and we are proposing no changes to the price inflation, wage inflation, and amortization payroll uh, growth, but we are looking at potentially decreasing the discount rate, but also 
an option of the current 6.625% is still reasonable. What you're seeing here um, is a range of Makita's 10 to 20 year expected return assumptions over the last six years compared to the board's adopted discount rate, which is represented by those yellow diamonds. Um, and so ideally the board has adopted a discount rate that is within this range of expected returns. There is a, a blip back in 2019 when the market conditions in December of 2018 uh, were very unusual. The market had crashed in December of 2018. Um, so price to earnings ratios were very low. And actually the, it, the discount, I mean, excuse me, the interest rates were a bit higher too in two, at the end of 2018. So those expected returns for 2019 were based on that 2018 anomaly. And so the board at that time decided to just stay the course and keep the discount rate at the same level at 6.75% rather than jumping up for that one year anomaly. Um, and so then last year, the board did decrease the discount rate to 6.625% based on uh, trying to be more in the middle of this range of expected returns um, from Makita. And then now looking at 2021, those expected returns have dropped anywhere between 20 basis points and 40 basis points, uh, whether you're looking at the short-term or long-term expected return on assets. So um, just to kind of give a little bit of a background on why it's important to align the discount rate and the assumed rate of return. Um, if your discount rate is set consistently higher than your expected return, um, your likelihood of meeting your target is going to be less than 50%. And so what does that mean? That means you're going to incur net actuarial losses over time. And then any shortfalls in the investment returns, you're going to need to make up with higher contributions in the future. So setting your discount rate closer to that middle of that range decreases the likelihood that you're going to have to increase your contributions going forward. And the takeaway here is really that the actual returns on your investments are really what is going to determine the cost of your plan. Um, but it is uh, best practice to try to, to set that discount rate as close as possible to what you expect the future to look like. So finally, um, this last slide here shows the estimated uh, cost impact of the proposed assumption changes. Uh, there are, uh, the chart is representing just changes in the discount rate, and there are two comparison lines here. The first line is looking at what the 2020 projections look like for this valuation at the current discount rate. Um, and then the second comparison line is the 2021 valuation, and this is still preliminary. Um, we've updated the asset returns, but we still are using estimated liabilities. Um, so that comparison line at the 6.625 uh, incorporates the great asset return as of fiscal year end 2021. Uh, you can see just comparing the same discount rate from last year to this year, you're seeing a large decreases in contributions for the city. Uh, and increases in the funded ratio, both on a market value and an actuarial value basis. So now looking at decreases in the discount rate, um, you, are, you will see increases in the city and the, the employee contribution rates and contribution dollars, uh, and you see slight decreases in the funded ratio. Um, kind of as a, as a benchmark or rule of thumb for every eighth of a percent drop in the discount rate, you're seeing about a 3% drop in the city's contribution rate, excuse me, a 3% increase in the city's contribution rate. And you're also gonna see an increase in the dollar amount for the city of about $8 million for every one eighth of a percent drop. Um, and then of course the member rates also increase um, when there are decreases in the discount rate because they are paying a proportion of the normal cost rate. Um, so that's about 40 basis points for every eighth of a percent drop for tier one members and a little bit higher for the tier two members at about 50 basis points. Um, and then you're seeing the 
also the drop in the funded ratio when you decrease the discount rate as well. Um, so the uh, discount rate changes do have a bigger impact than the demographic changes we are recommending. It's just a very minimal impact, a net city contribution increase of about $600,000 and a potential increase in the member rate through those demographic changes of about 10 basis points. Um, so with that, I think I'll turn that back over to Bill to wrap up our presentation and then open everything up for discussion. And, and I had a question. Sure. Uh, yeah, on this slide, just, I mean, it's great that the contribution uh, amount is, is not material, but how, how did you get up? How did the 600,000 come about? I was just trying to look at the numbers and see where it comes from. Okay, you won't be able to tie into the 600,000 because these are two separate graphs or two separate uh, assumptions that we're looking at here or set of assumptions. The top is just for the discount rate changes, that chart. And then the bottom half of that slide, that $600,000, is just the estimate that we uh, calculated based on the mortality change, the impact on the administrative expense assumption, and the merit uh, salary scale increase. So oh, okay. you, you can't really tie back into that number based on, because it's not, it's apples to oranges of the uh, exhibit above. Okay. Yeah. I think the 600000 is mostly due to the merit scale. It's uh, a little bit also due to the change in beneficiary mortality. Okay, but not as much with the, the discount rate. Not at all with the discount rate, correct. Yeah, the discount the rate has yeah. a much bigger impact. Right, the city's contribution um, dollar amount will increase um, by about $8 million if you uh, decrease the discount rate to 6.5%. And then another $8 million increase if you decrease the discount rate to 6.375%. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Can I jump in? Or? Yeah. Yes. Um, so is there a, how does one get your arms around the member rate increases? Is that a material dollar amount going from 11.3 to 11.7? Um, well, I believe that the payroll, <laughs> that and I don't, I don't even know if, go ahead, Bill. I think that depends on your perspective. From right. the plan perspective, it's not a material uh, dollar amount increase, but from the member's perspective, it may be. Yeah, I meant from a member's perspective, because, you know, I think as a, you know, as a, as a person getting a check, is it, is it a, Hundred dollar increase, or is it a several hundred dollar? You know, so I was just trying well, to calculate. Yeah, so it's 0.4 percent of their pay. Um, so, so if they're earning a hundred thousand, that's um, four hundred dollars. Thanks, that's helpful. Yeah. Per per year, or so. Per year, yes. Thanks. So um, we'll just open it up for discussion. We do need to get um, a board board decision on these. Uh, the demographic assumptions are mostly some minor tweaks. And uh, other than the discount rate, we're not suggesting any changes to the economic assumptions. So the, the big decision is the, the discount rate. Great. Um, thanks, Bill. Hey, let's let's do a round robin of the trustees. Then I want to go to um, Prabhu, I guess Roberto too, to weigh in. Um, and then we'll sort of open the floor generally. So, um, Andrew, why don't you go first? Um, any questions or comments? And no questions. Uh, just a comment, and it's more to um, give Sunita to answer Sunita's question from a, a plans per, or a member's perspective. Um, I think Bill is is spot on with with his comments. To your question, you know, from a plans perspective, it's very little. Okay. From a member's perspective, 
it it's going to range anywhere from probably anywhere from twenty dollars up to maybe sixty six seventy dollars a paycheck, um, depending on the rank and pay scale and all that stuff. Um, thing is, m most members probably won't they'll notice it, but they will. But they're looking at the bigger picture. So besides, so now if you go back, to, can you go back to that discount rate page that had that the summary? Um, yeah, that one. Um, so it, the numbers that we see here are combined police and fire. And I, I wrote down some numbers strictly for fire and Franco might have some for police side, um, but just for, so I'm gonna speak more on the fire side. So on the fire side, they are currently paying 11.9% into the pension system. Then on the healthcare side, they pay 8%. Okay, so now we're looking at 19.9%. So with these changes, now we're going over a little bit over 20%. That's the first time we've done over 20%. Um, and so, so members are looking at, the, at them combined and, and seeing if those are changes. So members will say, okay, I, now I pay over 20% into the pension system between you know, the pension and um, for healthcare benefit or healthcare, um, retirement healthcare. And then, you know, an additional, say, 20% for 20 to, you know, 20, 30% for, you know, state and federal taxes. So 40 to 50% of their paycheck is, is going towards other things now. And so that's the only thing they're going to be looking at. 100%, I agree. The, the, the numbers are small from a plan's perspective. Members might see something a little bit different. Um, but at the same time, they're getting a great benefit, too. Um, so it, the only thing that's different about this year in my mind is hey, hey, every year, can I ask yes. you a question? It's yeah. very helpful, by the way. I, yeah. I remember you saying this last month as well, um, without the numbers, but in concept, but, um, when you say 20, it's, um, 20% 20 of their, of their current employees or retirement, retired and current employees. Uh, I mean, a 20% contribution. Yeah. So all active, yeah, so all active members, people that are not retired and, and not collecting benefits. So all active members that are currently working, um, I'm just going to round numbers. 12% is going towards the pension and 8% is going to healthcare retirement benefits. So a okay. total of around 20% roughly. Okay. Got it. Um, and yeah. Um, Oh, what I was going to say, what's different about this year is whenever we've made adjustments to the discount rate, we've always took in considera consideration and our main focus was making sure it doesn't get too expensive for the plan sponsor because they're paying for the unfund liability. What's unique is this is the first time because of the windfall that we've had, you know, with our market returns last year, where the city's contributions could potentially be going down when employees um, payments are going up. Um, so that this is the first time that we've ever had that that situation, um, which is terrific for the city because we definitely want their payments to go down, which means um, their unfunded liability is going down and they're not making those extra payments. Um, the city also did indicate, I think one thing I picked up through our study sessions with them or joint meetings around POBs, they did indicate that they are comfortable with the current payments. I did notice that. Um, because they, they made the comment like, hey, if we do the POB, our payments will drop, but maybe we'll pay extra to keep at the same pace to pay down the mortgage, basically. Um, so I think we have some three strong options here. I think all of them uh, would make sense, um, you know, if we want to keep it the same or, you know, drop it, you know, a little to take advantage of the, you know, the market returns that we got last year. Um, but I do believe in the bigger picture, we're at a good spot, if not, you know, right where we want to be, um, you know, around the discount rate. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Um, Sunita, any comments or questions? Well, that was incredibly helpful, Andrew. I really appreciate your perspective on this. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it seems to me uh, that given how rare you know these windfall years are that uh, it, it's it might benefit us uh, to actually consider a lowering of the discount rate that's sort of what 
I guess qualitatively, I'm thinking, understanding there's a cost of doing that. That's sort of uh, where I'm leaning, but I'm happy to hear what others have to say. Uh, thanks, Nina. Howard, any comments or questions? Um, no, uh, thank you, uh, Anne and, and Bill. It was a very good presentation. Uh, with respect to the discount rate, um, you know, given the, you know, the uncertainty with the Fed and uh, where interest rates are going, it seems like a lot of people uh, are speculating where it would go. Um, does the, the changing in interest rates, supposing they might creep up, I mean, who knows? Uh, will that change the um, that estimated 10 to, 10 to 20 year uh, expected return on assets and, and therefore potentially influence where we want the discount rate to be given that, um, as Ann mentioned, we wanna be sort of in the middle of that range. That, I guess that's my question. And, and I guess also we only review this once a year. Is that right on the discount rate? We review the discount rate once a year. Um, so we can revisit it again for the next valuation. Uh, interest rate changes do change um, the capital market assumptions going forward. Uh, and then the other thing that is, is very significant is the price earnings ratios uh, or valuations uh, in stocks. So the, the combination of those thing, those two things seems to um, they're not the only factors, obviously, and, and maybe Laura could go into more detail or uh, Prabhu, um, but those are very uh, significant factors in the capital market assumptions going forward. We actually go back to slide, I think it was 14. Just kind of put Howard's contact or question in context. And so this here, the 2021, the, the gray is what um, is projected for expected returns. But does that pad in, for example, Howard's question about um, expected interest rate increases? Well, so these are based on uh, Makita. The 5.9 is Makita's 10-year expectation, and 6.7 is their 20-year expectation. Uh, as I understand that those expectations were based on the market conditions last December. And uh, so it may have changed slightly uh, since then, but it included uh, their expectations for what would happen with interest rates at that time uh, going forward. Yeah, we, um, we update our capital market assumptions annually. So there will be an update um, coming out uh, end of January, early February that we'll use for next year's asset allocation process. And back to the question on, on how the discount rate influences the expected return on assets, um, they're not directly related. Um, typically, our clients um, like to choose an asset allocation with an expected investment return that has at least a 50% probability of meeting the discount rate. Um, so in some cases, a board would choose or an investment committee would choose to um, to lower um, the expected return on assets by changing the portfolio if the discount rate goes down. In other cases, they might just like to continue having a better probability of hitting that discount rate over time. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I think it makes sense to you know, stay where we are, obviously. Um, I thought thanks, Howard. Question down. was a really go good ahead. Yeah, jump. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, jump in. So I just want to make sure, Laura, I'm understanding. So is it fair to say is that the 5.9 to 6.7 range of return is it has some expectation of rate cycles embedded in, in these numbers? And then there's also the equity risk premium, of course. That's um, right. Yeah. So they're the, not so that, they're pretty sticky. Would, would that sort of yeah. Thing? I mean, these are long term expectations, you know, 10 and 20 years. So short term changes aren't going to have a huge impact typically. Um, but yes, um, interest rates are one of the, the building blocks that we use to come up with um, expectations for asset class returns. Thanks. Sure. Um, you're done, right, Howard? Thank you. All right. Eshra, over to you. Yeah, I think uh, just to add on to the previous comments and questions, uh, I mean, I think Prabhu has said this before, the fact that uh, the markets have done well since the end of last year kind of means those expected returns probably come down. But I think uh, the risk-free rate on the 10-year was about 75 basis points end of last year. 
and now it's about 1.5. Um, and then that's kind of the starting point. So that probably pushes things up a bit. I don't know how it nets out. I mean, you know, I don't know the everything about the asset allocation. Uh, but uh, just to, my question is, so these change, if you do change the discount rate, does it apply for the next, next fiscal year, which starts uh, July 1st, 2022, or does it start before that? Uh, it, it takes effect with the June 30th, 2021 valuation, which is used to determine contributions for the following fiscal year. So for the 22-23 fiscal year. Okay, so then um, if, since we run the asset allocation models at the start of the year, and we're looking for contributions for the next, next fiscal year, should we wait for the next asset allocation model before we see whether we should make a change? Uh, it, generally, I would say no, you should uh, make this decision based on the asset allocation model you have now, unless you're anticipating a significant change in that asset allocation model. I mean, I'm just saying that may be more current because we're talking about things for the next fiscal year and we will have the next set of numbers in terms but, of these expected returns but, before that. But you won't have another chance to change the discount rate until November of next year. It's a, so to, to respond to the question, this, the way the schedule is, is um, we set the discount rate based on past information. I understand your concern that, you know, it would be better to do it in January after we get the full data. You know, one thing that you can take into consideration is the board has discretion to consider those things at this time in anticipation for those numbers or what the current market conditions are. So like for what Ann had mentioned earlier, when she discussed the slide in 2019, you see the, the expected rate of return was much higher and that was a fluke. And so the board exercised its discretion to set the, continue the discount rate um, and not take those returns into consideration. So this is just a guidepost and background, but you know. Right, right. Now yeah. I understand that kind of how we've done historically, we kind of set it now, uh, but the board can choose to do it at a different time too. Isn't it, I mean? It, not really. Uh, we need to set it for the June 30th valuation each year. And so we typically start that process uh, in the fall, we could change the time that we do it, but it could it only can take effect as of June thirtieth of each year. Okay. So if you if you were to wait until the spring to do it, it would not take effect until the June thirtieth, twenty twenty two valuation. This is as late as you can push it for the June thirtieth. 2021. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All done, Ashwar? Yes, I'm done. Uh, Mumbai signing off, true. What's that? <laughs> no, I said on this topic, Mumbai is signing off. Oh, yeah. Have a, uh, what's it, what time is it there now? One in the morning? Uh, it, no, it's 10 o'clock. Uh, 10 p.m. 10 p.m. Yeah. All right. Have a good night, Ashwar. Thanks for dialing in. No, no, no. I just said on this topic, I'm staying on the meeting. So. <laughs> well, we'll see if we can give you up till 2 a.m. We'll do our best, you know. That's Go ahead, fine. Dick. Any questions or comments, Dick? Yes, Mr. Chair. First of all, people have to realize, all of you out there, some of you have echoing where you're at. At least I'm trying to listen very carefully, and it's hard. If you can slow your comments down a little bit, I would appreciate it. I'm trying to listen very carefully. The echoing is killing me. I want to say to um, Trustee Garnier, he really made the heat dissected that real well. But I would say this to, uh, as a retiree, when you're working in San Jose Police and Fire today, uh, the cost seems to be going up for the members. And we all working hard to reduce the city's contribution. But at the same time, these firefighters and police officers get less benefits today as compared to other plans. So that is going to be a tough one for them every time they hear this cost go up, whether it be authorization or this increase by 0.1%.
So that's just a comment. Uh, we're very blessed to have the plan we have, but I'm just saying that is reality. Thank you. Oh, great. Thanks, Dick. Um, over to you, uh, Franco. Yeah, so I'll, I'll start with my personal feeling is that we stay the same. And I have a few reasons why. Um, one, I'm looking at optics. The optics for our members is going to be that the city's looking at these pension obligation bonds to, you know, take this cost off their shoulders. They're already seeing savings. And then as I look at it, I want to say our tier one is going to go up probably around 65 to 70 bucks. And then our tier two, probably about 108. So they're paying more, the city paying less, and they're, de you know, deferring it on pen pension obligation bonds. Now, it's fine in, you know, in a greater world where they want to hire 500 more, you know, cops and firefighters, but that's not their intention. And I'll defer to Dave because obviously he's more involved in the, the active stuff now that I'm retired, but they're not looking to fill our academies like they were. They're actually looking to bring it down. So they're not taking these costs and putting it back into the system. They're taking the costs and they're putting it elsewhere. <clears throat> and I think those optics are not going to be pleasant in an environment that we're looking at where we're struggling to hire in the first place. And I'll also add that with the returns that we had this year, even if we just hit our number or are slightly under, if you smooth it over two years, we're still doing a phenomenal job. It, it, it's not like we're going to completely miss this. And we've got our consultants telling us, well, you could stay the same. That'd be completely acceptable. And then I also looked at, I think, and you know, the consultants can correct me if I'm wrong. I think there's two or three systems that are actually lower than we are. All the rest are higher and trying to get to where we are. And we've been there for a while. Any, anything else, Franco? No, that's all I had. Thanks, Dave. Any questions or comments? <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, no real questions, just the comments to speak to uh, what Franco was saying as far as the active members. Uh, we went from a high of one time at 1,450 officers. We're only at 1,160 right now. Uh, we had academies of 50 and 60 at a time. Our next academy is slated to be somewhere around 20, 25 uh, people. We're having a very hard time, obviously, in this climate, doing any kind of recruiting and bringing people in. We already have one of the highest uh, pension contribution plans in uh, the Bay Area. So to have them even contribute more would be a negative impact on recruiting as well. With the... Uh, Consultant saying that we'd be perfectly fine staying at 6625. I, I would agree with uh, Franco and uh, Andrew and uh, Howard that we stay there. Uh, great. Um, thanks, Dave. So, yeah, let me let me weigh in and then I'll turn over to Roberto and, Pr and Prabhu. Um, so the offsite in 2018, we sort of set this mechanism for determining um, our discount rate, and everybody is referring to that, so it's working. We said the first thing we do, and, and Bill really kicked this off almost a decade ago, we, we look at our system compared to others and compared in an absolute sense and try to assess what risk meant to us. And Bill's been saying for a long time that you are a, we are a riskier plan. And the reason why is because market volatility impacts us more strongly than other people. And if you don't remember why, Bill can go through it, but it's due to the ratio of actives versus retirees and a bunch of other internal metrics. So we reacted to that by dialing down our discount rate before our peers did. Now, there are two components. I mean, we, we even got past the first of three or four steps, right? One is to say... Um, Okay, so let's be a less risky plan than our peers, right? Grading on a curve. If we are inherently a riskier or subject to volatility more, let's be like, well, we've done that. And, and you saw that last month. Uh, Bill and Ann showed that, you know, we're down near the bottom. Hang on. 
blow dry uh, uh somebody's raking leaves outside so um we've got that and then we can also ask well that's grading on a curve but absolute sense and i'll let prabhu answer that but i think you're giving a little foreshadowing i think prabhu has generally said you know mr chairman i think we're at about roughly you know plus a, a core an eighth of point minus an eighth roughly in terms of absolute risk we can take on we're probably about right then um what we need to do is once we've sort of picked this risk level we want right we translate it into a target volatility we can accept which is 12 percent um that comes from makita and barris right um and then we translate that into an asset allocation strategy which matches that volatility and we've done that you guys have all been involved in that and then we go back and do what ann was talking about and then we say okay so we've kind of picked this level of risk we've kind of picked an asset allocation which matches that level of risk we've looked at then from makita well and other sources well what do we think something with that level of risk would actually return and then as ann suggested we we don't have to but we've tended to put our discount rate to match that forecast which again is not trivial because a 10-year forecast a 20-year forecast and a 30-year forecast all yield slightly different rates of return and then we set that discount rate and then we go forward so my sense is that we're at about the right level of risk um, I noticed that when you surf the internet, and I did last night, uh, generally speaking, plans across the risk spectrum, actuaries and, and financial consultants are recommending somewhere in the high sixes um, to about six and a half percent. So we're in that range, both, both relative and absolute. I wouldn't see changing it. I think, I think David Franco had actually a very good reason not to change it, which is if it's if it's not broke, don't break it. Um, although I certainly am willing to listen to other arguments, um, and I think I'm, I will turn over to Prabhu in just a minute, Roberto. You know, it's impossible to tell, of course, because I, as a you know, we don't know what the Fed's going to do. But I I think if I'm going to turn over to you first, Prabhu, in just a minute. I think what Prabhu is going to tell us is, yeah, I think we can get the right asset allocation within that risk window and hit this target. So let me turn it over to you, Prabhu, first, and let me have you um, speak, Roberto. Go ahead, Prabhu. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think you've said it all, I mean, and, and the other trustees have made great points. So I'll keep it short. Um, um, bottom line is, I don't think we need to lower our discount rate. And I'll explain that both from uh, to Trustee Menon's point about capital market assumptions and asset allocation. So Makita's 20 year number at the beginning of the year was 6.7%. And we've had year to date returns of about 12% or 12, 12 to 13%. And you, you spread it over 13 years or 12, 20 years. So you would assume that you have to decrease your expected returns by about 50 basis points, give or take. So that's what you're going to see at the beginning of next year, unless something drastic happens in the market between now and then. So that 6.7 is going to come down to 6.25 maybe. But that 6.25 does not include any active manager returns. And we've been going at about 30 to 50 basis points per year. So you, so it sort of nets out. So we've had a good year in terms of beta, but then you add on the alpha. So the, the return assumption is going to be about the same when you add the active returns. Um, so I, you know, I've, I've always been in favor of, you know, as you rightly said, uh, when we look at our asset allocation, I like to be a little bit, I, I, I like to be aggressive on our asset allocation, given the constraints of uh, the risk discussions that we've had uh, in the past few years. And our expected returns typically tend to come out at about 50, 75 basis points higher than the discount rate. And I, I, I like to keep that sort of gap, that cushion. So we actually consistently do better than, than the discount rate. So, I mean, the only argument I would make to lower the discount rate is if, it can, if we can put more money in the system, it's always a good thing, but without impacting our, our retirees. Uh, and since we cannot do that, since it has an effect both on the sponsor and the retirees, uh, that's that's a consideration, of course, that you all take into account. So I'm 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 uh, 
quite happy with where the discount rate is uh, right now. And, and as someone mentioned, we've consistently been at the forefront of lowering this discount rate. And you know, we had, we had a sharp correction in the markets last year and it rebounded. But if something like that were to happen again going forward, and if we don't see a bounce back, uh, one could actually make the argument that we should increase our discount rate. Uh, but that's a discussion for another day. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Roberto, why don't you speak and then we'll open the floor up for any final thoughts. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Prabhu, for the uh, short explanation. We appreciate it. Um, I, I agree with everything that was said. Uh, I think Prabhu and the rest of the trustees are correct. I mean, I, this is a, it's, it's a good um, discussion and, and, and problem to have. It's like when you have two great candidates for a position and they're both fantastic, you can't go wrong. If you stay, it's the right decision. If you move, it's also the right decision. Um, I'll leave the uh, investment and uh, volatility and asset allocation to uh, the investment people. I think Prabhu explained that very, very well. I do agree with him that given the recent run-up on the market, uh, the, the expectation for the next uh, 10, 20 years will be lower. But uh, again, these, these uh, expectations assume a passive approach. So when you add the active, I think he's right that we could be right there. Um, the only comment I will make, uh, again, I, I support staying at 6.625. The only other comment I'd like to make is in terms of uh, decreasing the rate will be, uh, I think someone mentioned this before. I think it was uh, uh, Mikita uh, that mentioned that uh, plans like to have a 50-50 chance of, of meeting the discount rate. I think this board um, historically has um, uh, attempt to get a little higher of a uh, 50%, maybe in the 55 to 59% range. And, uh, and, and if you are looking to do that and the assumptions will be lower, um, you're probably better off decreasing it just a, a, a bit. Uh, but again, uh, that would be the only comment I would make in terms of, um, there are others obviously, but in terms of supporting the decrease in the rate. I think staying at 6.65 is appropriate. Uh, your board has been, um, uh, has led uh, many of the plants in California in the past, as, as Drew indicated. And even today is one of the top four or five in terms of a lower discount rate. So uh, whatever you decide will be fine. Uh, I certainly support also staying at the 6.65. Thank you. Thanks, Ruth. Floor is open. Everyone jump in. I just had a question uh, about uh, the point uh, Roberto you made that Makita said about if you want to try and be at a 50% probability of, I think, making the return. So if we continue in this 5.9 to 6.7 range and we leave the discount rate at 6.625%, uh, 6 what, where is that, what are the odds of that? You want to cover that, Prabhu, or, or, or Laura? Yeah. Or Laura, yeah. Uh, so our actual, our actual, if you look at our asset allocation, uh, you know, it's, we look at 20 years, of course, though we do provide the 10 year number and we've typically been, uh, I would say about 50 basis points higher than the discount rate in terms of our expected return. Uh, because of course, these are all, you know, uh, when you look back and, and I think Drew has done this exercise for us and we've, we've seen these numbers, you look back. And, and Makita's forecasts have not been off by much uh, because you know forecasting is never easy. But if you look back at our numbers, uh, I would say that we've we've done we've done better than the fifty percent in terms of you know, beating our discount rate over the last twenty years. And so I think again, if when you, uh, I don't want to think uh, you know uh, put this out ahead of time. Uh, There's a lot of discussion that's uh, you know needs to be that needs to take place. Uh, when we consider our asset allocation early next year, but I suspect that whatever we recommend and adopt would be somewhere in the 6.75% range. So again, higher than the six and five eights that we currently have. Uh, any other questions? Uh, and so if, yeah. we, if we do end up, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go, go ahead, I'll go second. I'm sure yours is better. No, I was just going to say, I, I think uh, I agree with uh, kind of the consensus here, which is keep it at 6.625. I think we see how things, uh, 
the new asset allocation kind of looks. Uh, we're also doing the pension obligation bonds where we've made certain assumptions, you know, 6.625 being one of those in this calculations. Uh, and maybe, you know, maybe this time next year, maybe time to kind of revisit this. I guess I'm the only one who's a little um, sort of off the consensus. I'm not saying we shouldn't keep it at 6.625%, but I just want to convince myself, I guess. I, I don't think it's a mistake to keep it at 6.625, but obviously if you move one thing here, there's a cost somewhere else. So I'm just trying to get my, I'm almost there. Um, so if I may ask one more question. Yeah, um, yeah floor's open, go ahead, yeah. Okay. Uh, I think we, if we end up lowering to six and a half and you operate at the 50 basis point asset allocation um, sort of strategy, so to speak. So that's about 7% and you meet that, then essentially the this year we have reduced the we have reduced the unfunded liability we've increased the contributions and uh, let's say you had a normal year not an abnormal year like you know you've had in the last uh, in 2020 uh, what would happen then to the unfunded liability and the contributions if you exceed the six and a half percent so bill and you're good bill yeah so if you exceed the expected well, if you just meet the expected return, we have a contribution schedule in place that is going to reduce the unfunded liability over time. If you exceed the return, it's going to go down faster and contributions will go down compared to our expectations. Let me, um, let me just bring up our model so we can show that. Is the, are you seeing the model no. or did it change? No, yet. Okay. I think I have to, may need to stop sharing and then reshare. Hold on. Okay, are you seeing the model now? Yes. So this is our projection. At, uh, let me change the baseline here. So this is our projection at 6.625 right now. Uh, let me change this to show. So we're at uh, about 1.2 billion in UAL on a market value of assets basis. And we're projecting it to go down over time. And this is all with 6.625. So uh, let's just say we got a 10% return so that you can see the difference here for five years. That's going to move up the time when we get to full funding and have paid this off compared to the expected. And at the same time, it's going to reduce the contributions even further. Bill, I like that option. Can you make that happen? Uh, that's up to Prabhu. Uh, <laughs> say, as, as much of a rock star Prabhu is, that's a, that's a pretty steep. <laughs> Abu only promised 10% for 2022. He hasn't spoken about 2023 and forward. So I don't want to be difficult. It's up to my buddy, Jay Powell. <laughs> um, you know, we also want to be cognizant of potential bad options. Um, and, and so we've got because we're uh, recognizing these exceptional returns over five years, even some bad returns coming in uh, don't hit us hard immediately. But then over time, uh, they would have a significant impact and bring our, our contributions back up. But when we come back with the... Um, full valuation presentation, we'll update these and show you some scenarios so you can um, kind of get your arms around the level of risk and, and what to expect uh, going forward. 
that the general. But but you you have the discount rate here at six point six two five. I was asking on a scenario where you reduced it to six and a half. Is it is it material? Maybe I'm overthinking this. Um, it, it's hard to see when we move between the two. Generally, what you'll see with the six and a half is uh, we have higher contributions initially, and then it depends on what happens with the investment returns. And because the bar is at six and a half instead of 6.625, it's uh, slightly more likely that future contributions will be lower than we projected uh, than it is at 6.625. So it, it's really, you know, once you set that discount rate um, with these back to six and a half. It, uh, so the red line is what it, the contributions would have been at six and five eighths, and the gold bars are at six and a half. Uh, so if we only earn six and a half, they stay higher. Um, but if we actually earn, If we actually, there's such a small difference there, it's hard to see any any change. And we get to once we get to full funding, then it's just the normal cost. So an eighth of a point is just a very slight difference. Okay, yeah, that, that, that's helpful in itself because I guess it's not, uh, you may as well not rock the boat if the difference isn't much. The the floor is still open. And, and Sunita, um, you know, just I, it wouldn't be rocking the boat. Um, you know, it, it, argument could be easily made for six and a half or sustain the, the same. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, taking advantage of the, the windfall that we just had, you know, you know, makes sense. So I don't, I, just, I know you're struggling between six and, you know, six and, you know, five eighths and six and a half you know, there is no wrong answer, you know? Um, so, so to don't feel, don't feel bad that you're struggling with the decision either way, it's good. Um, and, um, you know, I, I'm making my decision, you know, basically because it, I keep seeing the employees cost uh, side going up and that does seem to be a little bit of a concern. Um, you know, is that the right approach to take? Not too sure. Uh, but either way, we're in a good position at, you know, 6.625 or six and a half. Yeah. I think the, the one thing to think about, though, uh, on this, and, and I agree with what's said, and keeping it six and five eighths is very reasonable uh, decision to make. The one consideration that hasn't gotten into this discussion is that uh, we don't want to be put in a situation where we need to move the discount rate by a significant amount. And so if you, because that creates uh, an immediate shock, both to the members and the city in terms of their budget. And so we've always tried to take it in, in small steps. And so if you think that there's a risk that we'd have to go even lower, um, taking a small step now, even though it doesn't look like much uh, it would be a prudent thing to do. But if you're not thinking that there's much risk that we'd have to go um, even lower, then staying at six and five eighths makes perfect sense. Yeah, I, I think where I'm landing on this is if you ask me um, my expected returns for the next 10 years, um, I would be biased downward. Um, and I think if I were to completely forget about the liability side of the equation for a minute, I would say my bias would be to step down. But clearly the liability side and the funding side is a consideration. And if there was a material difference, then I would say I would probably push for a six and a half because we should, like you said, you know, if, if long-term returns are going down, we should sort of land softly, so to speak. But since there isn't a material difference, I, I think I'm comfortable with either assumption. 
the 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 only thing I would I would say uh, to to Trustee Sunita's point is that you know, uh, and I've seen this happen uh, here as well as in other systems, um, and I and I completely agree on the point about lower expected returns going forward, uh, given what's happened in the last ten or fifteen years. But when you when you lower your discount rate, uh, there's a tendency to be more conservative with your asset allocation, simply because now the hurdle is lower. And I'm not saying that we are afflicted by that mindset, but that's something to keep in mind. Uh, if it's a little bit more challenging, I'm okay with that hurdle because it, it forces us to be more creative and to come up with an asset allocation that can beat that. So just- a Excellent point. Thank you, Prabhu, for that perspective. Uh, floor still open. Uh, I'll wrap it a big bill. Oh, actually, oh, chair, question. Chairman, there's a comment from uh, Council Lederman. Oh, sorry, thanks, Harvey. Jump in. Floor's open, Harvey. Just jump in. Hey, thanks very much. Uh, um, picking up on Prabhu's last comment, I, I might offer to characterize it a little bit differently. And that is, uh, with with the uh, improved, the significantly improved funding of the system, is there an opportunity for the board affirmatively to take some, to dial back on the risk in the portfolio, be a little bit more conservative so that we don't risk losing that higher funded status and use this as an opportunity uh, to take a little risk off the table um, and, and in fact, be a little more conservative in uh, our risk. You know, drop that standard deviation below 12 um, and take that risk off the table for the, both, the, both the employees and the, and the, and the city. Um, that, that is something that a number of systems are doing uh, simply be, because of the uh, terrific increase in in the funded status of the plan and not to risk that in going back into uh, an un underfunded uh, you know an increase in the unfunded liability so i would characterize it a little bit different perhaps than our cio in that regard uh, as as not an expectation of gain in the future but an affirmative act by the board to dial back on risk given the opportunity that's been created by such terrific returns and increase in the funded status at this stage. You want to take that, Prabhu? <laughs> yeah, I hate to disagree with Harvey. He'll come back and haunt me later. Um, no, I think, look, I, think, I think as a general rule, uh, uh, Harvey's right. I, I think a lot of our sister systems uh, will probably do that and take advantage of it. And I'm also assuming that many of them are better funded than us. Uh, and and when, I, when I think of San Jose, I think of both police and fire and federated. And so I, I would certainly be more conservative and take risk off the table uh, when we are close to 100% funded. Um, and I think we've had a fantastic year and we've done well. Uh, but personally, I, would, I wouldn't as yet uh, take my gas off the pedal, my foot off the pedal. Uh, floor still open. I think it's it's also a function of interest rates, right? As you said, Mr. Powell, if if rate, interest rates were higher, I guess you could take risk off the pedal. Yeah, yeah, you you could, uh, but I think uh, we have this new drug. Uh, from the central bank that we are all hooked on. And I, uh, I don't think that's going to go away anytime soon. Or we Let's die. Go Let me go ahead and, and wrap this up by making one observation. And Sunita, you did a great job at teeing this up. So we described a four step process um, for setting the discount rate. We said, well, look at risk. How much can we tolerate? We'll translate that using volatility into an asset allocation. We'll Ask McKeith and Barris, third step, hey, how much do you think we can make on that? And then we'll set the discount rate based on that. Except as Sunita pointed out rightly, and, and Bill and Ann always do, that's only half the question. And Bill and Ann in their presentation pointed this out, right? 
this is not just an economic forecast of what's going to happen with the assets. This is an economic forecast of what's going to happen with the expenses, the benefits. And as I said, when I became chair for the second time, there's a long looping study that I'm kind of working on in the background. And the board has heard about this, getting ready for the whole board to get involved as we gather stuff and Roberto and Prabhu and Barbara helping with this. And that's the, what is the appropriate discount rate for benefits? And we said at the offsite in 2018 that there was a fifth step to our process. And the fifth step is to ask, which we don't know yet, right? We've got to study it, is to ascertain if there's a systemic bias to our forecast um, of benefits and expenses. And some of us believe there is, right? And we can only really determine that by going back and looking at history, and Bill and Ann are, are going to help us to do that. And if that's true, then that may also impact the discount rate, because the discount rate, again, is not just applied to assets, it's applied to assets and expenses. Bill, Bill's famous tank picture has, has assets flowing money in, contributions flowing money in, and has running the plan and expenses flowing out. It's in balance when we forecast all that. So um, that, I don't want to open the floor for discussion. I just want to remind everybody, we are working on that fifth step to set discount rate. We haven't gotten there yet. Um, I, as chairman, will move. Um, that we accept uh, the recommendations on slide 16 with the discount rate at 6.625%. Is that enough, Bill and Roberto? Is that enough for motion? I think so, Bill. Is that what you need? Yep, that's enough for us. That's great. Uh, that motion on the floor is a second. Second, Santos. Great. Motion by Lance, second by Santos. Go around the room. Andrew, how do you vote? Aye. Anita. Aye. Howard. Yes. Ashbar. Aye. By votes aye. Dick. Yes. Franco. Aye. Dave. Aye. I'm Chair Lanza and I vote aye as well. What um why don't we take I know um Robert was okay with you. Let me take Councilman Foley out of order. I know she, that she can't be here forever. And then after you go, uh, Councilman Foley will take a brief break. So uh, Pam, over to you. Thank you so much for jumping in or, or letting me jump ahead of the line. Uh, I really appreciated that discussion over the discount rate and the cost to our employees. And, and frankly, I was glad to hear that you're leaving the discount rate where it is. Uh, Andrew's right and Franco and Dave are all right. If we increase the retirement cost to our police and fire, it jeopardizes our, our ability to retain and hire uh, and, and maintain the staff that we have. So uh, I, I, I was glad to hear what you, the vote that you just took. Um, just a couple of things. We, uh, we were looking at reallocating some of the American Relief Package funds on Tuesday, but we, uh, which would have included a proposal by the mayor to increase hiring of police officers uh, uh, using those ARPA funds, but we had to pull it off the table because there is some concerns about our general fund and income we receive elsewhere, and we have to resolve that first before we know what to do with those funds. So that's not gonna come back to council probably until January. It, it may even be embedded in the budget process next year. Other things that we're working on, I know that you passed, and I'm sorry I missed it, you passed the, you approved the recommendation by the retiree board, President Ray Storms regarding mental health. And I've met with Ray and uh, we're looking at moving forward with that and how we need to do that at the city council level. Of course, there's a uh, bargaining involved, so we'll need to engage, uh, whoever we need to, to make sure that it happens and, and see how that, um, how we can get that implemented. But it's, it, it's not as easy as saying, yes, we're gonna do it. Although uh, I absolutely agree that there is a need to do it, but how we do it is going to be the question and whether we have difficulty or not. I can't even predict that at this point. Those who've been on this board for a long time probably can guess how difficult it's gonna be, but we'll see, we'll see. Um, 
the other thing I wanted to, so I, I just wanted to conclude that topic by saying I'm a, a huge advocate in support of it and hoping we can get it to be accepted and approved. The last thing I just wanted to mention is really just kind of a general update regarding the city. We're going through redistricting right now uh, where we have to move city council district boundaries around in order to equalize the representation for each council person. Currently my district, District 9, is under, uh, has lost residents. So we need to gain about 6,000 in order to be equalized with everyone else. How those boundaries move, move around, who, who knows? Uh, it's very controversial. A lot of people have different maps of how it will impact the, the various districts. I just hope that my district stays intact and grows a little bit, but you know that's up to the commissioners. It will come to the city council eventually. And uh, the idea is just to equalize representation so that we have fair representation throughout the city. That's really all that I have to report unless you have any questions for me. Mr. Lord Chair Lord Santos. Good, Dick. Yeah, to council member Foley, I wanna thank you for just being sensitive on the issue of uh, the health benefits for potential retirees, because you, I know you're going through so many challenges right now and to just the ideas that you addressed it. We are all appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you, I appreciate that. It's important. Any floors open, any other comments? If not, hey Pam, thanks a lot for the kind words you said about outgoing um, trustee Vincent's area at the council meeting. It meant a lot to all of us. You know, I, I was just going to mention that too. I'd forgotten about that. He's just one of my favorite guys. He's truly a mentor to me. And I know he's mentored many uh, of the trustees who are here today. And Drew, I know you were involved lockstep with him in a lot of those changes that you made so many years ago. So I, I value him as a friend. I value him as a mentor and, and uh, I'll get to continue to uh, pick his brain as much as I possibly can, but it's uh, unfortunate that he can't serve on this board anymore. Thank you. Thanks, Pam. Um, I see the clock at 1013. Um, let, we'll, we're going to come back with Roberto. Let's come back in about seven minutes at 1020 and we'll start with you. Okay, Roberto? Yes, sir. With great. that, I'm, ta I'm taking off. Thank you very much. Have a great rest of your meeting. Thanks, Pam. Take care. All right, right. Uh, seven Bye. minute break till 10 20.
Sinti. Uh, let me take a look. We got Sinitas here. So yeah, we got everybody, everybody back. Um, over to you, Roberto. Item 4A, your update. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm sure you cannot tell, but uh, Prabhu and I just uh, happened to be at the office this morning. He's right next to me. I'm sure he can hear me right now, just like I, I can hear him when he's speaking. And uh, during the break, we just took a, a, a short walk uh, to uh, say hello to some of our staff. And, uh, you know, uh, he hasn't really met everyone. I think he actually met two of our newer uh, employees uh, this morning. Um, so we're looking forward to at some point getting back to the office. And, and with that, let me just, uh, let me just update you. Um, as part of the city two stage, a mandatory vaccination the program, uh, the city now is in the stage two, which means that uh, so September 30th, every employee had to either be vaccinated and if they have elected not to be vaccinated, uh, then they had two exemptions either under the, the um, um, medical or religious. And if they didn't file one of those, then they will need to at their own time uh, provide a twice a week a negative test uh, for COVID and um, or, or either be subject to some uh, form of disciplinary action if they didn't do that, including up to termination. Uh, so I'm happy to report that um, um, we as a staff has pretty much uh, almost its in entirety follow up with the city uh, uh, requirements. Uh, the city also kick off in November. Um, I'm going to say sort of like a soft opening from the standpoint the, the offices are open, but um, they started bringing some of the department employees back. Um, we are sort of to an extent doing the same. That's why Prabhu and I went out to say hello to some of the staff. Uh, so starting November 1st, um, we initiated a soft opening and we have a limited number of people uh, uh, in the office, mostly on the benefit side. Uh, we are actually uh, implemented our appointment uh, application and we are actually taking a very limited number of uh, appointments for members in person. So if they have an appointment at a particular time, they will knock on the door, we'll open it for them. Uh, all the other appointments will continue through Zoom and Teams as we have done in the past. Um, and so, you know, we, we, we are kind of keeping track of, of that situation. We had a, uh, a quarterly staff meeting uh, last October uh, where we updated uh, the staff. And uh, we want to make sure that uh, the overrunning factor here is to make sure that our staff uh, stay healthy. Uh, and so also is the health of our members. So uh, we will be um, drafting some uh, procedures going forward to start bringing some of the staff back at some point. Like I said, we have a very, very uh, soft opening, limited number of people at the office right now. And as things develop, uh, we will keep you posted. Uh, but the office uh, still remains closed. But again, we will have more information that I, I'll share with the board in writing a later date. Um, we have started the recruitment process for the vacant uh, network technician position. Uh, and we also have other vacancies for which we're going to initiate uh, recruitment process as the city uh, just uh, recently terminated uh, the freezing of the position so we can go ahead and start uh, recruiting uh, for the other positions that we have uh, at the office. Um, we also wanted to let you know that the open health enrollment for retirees started uh, November 1st. That was on Monday. Uh, I, I will be interested in knowing, uh, Dick, um, the, we sent out the enrollment packets uh, this week. They should be either they had just arrived to your homes or they should be arriving soon. Did you receive yours, Dick? I'm here, yeah. Go ahead. Did you receive your open health enrollment packet already? No. So it should be coming. They went out this week, uh, probably a little later than we would have liked, uh, but they should be arriving at everyone's house uh, this, uh, this week. We did send out earlier uh, some postcards providing some information. Again, just like last year, we are not having the health fair in person. Uh, it's gonna be virtual. Uh, we have been sending out also uh, email communication. We have actually used Facebook and Twitter to communicate 
with our members and let them know uh, when the vendors have scheduled presentations. And so we are interacting uh, with our members as we speak. Again, uh, those packets should be arriving this week. Um, and uh, as soon as they arrive, Franco, you also, I forgot, you are such a young guy, but you are retired. Reed, did you receive your packet? Sorry, Franco stepped away to get some coffee. He hasn't made it back yet. Okay, all right. So uh, in any case, again, that should be arriving soon. And uh, I don't really expect any challenges uh, as we did smoothly last year. Uh, also, I wanted to report that the staff did present to the FED retiree group on open enrollment. They did this uh, past October 14. Um, I think lastly, I wanted to bring you up today, as you know, you have a vacancy in, the, uh, in your board. And so we are working with the city clerk. Um, I don't have many informa much information right now, but I know they're working on the application process for your vacant position that was left vacant by uh, the resignation of former trustee Sunseri, which as, as council member uh, mentioned and Chair Lanza, uh, he received uh, um, a, a ceremony last week at the city, at the city council uh, which uh, Prabhu and I attended with the chair and vice chair of your board. Uh, very well deserved. So congratulations, Vince, if you are listening. Uh, and then also, I wanted to let you know, uh, Dave Wilson was actually, I don't know if you recall, he actually was elected to the position because Franco Beto actually retired. Franco came back to your board as the retiree police, and Dave took over the position by Franco. That particular position actually ends November 30th. So, so Franco uh, position with the board ends on November 30th. Having said that, I just wanted to let you know a couple of things. Number one, as council always remind me, Dave will remain a trustee until the board or the city council either reappoints Dave or they appoint a new trustee. But um, I just want to let you know the city clerk is actually working with the city uh, on resolution and a process to possibly change the, the Muni code so that they, since they was just elected this year, they can reappoint him to the position without having to go through a lengthy process. Now, I will keep you posted on that process. That's a process between the city attorney's office, the city clerk, they need to, OER is involved because they need to get um, um, get involved with the bargaining units to make sure that they're okay with changing the mini code. I will keep you posted. Uh, but suffice to say that um, uh, Dave Wilson uh, will remain a trustee until a new trustee is appointed. And hopefully the city clerk is able to work with the rest of the city on changing the mini code so that he can be reappointed to your board sooner rather than later. Um, that, oh, and lastly, the newsletter uh, has been issued. You should be receiving it soon. Um, and we will be closed on November 11th uh, to celebrate Veterans Day. So that concludes my um, update, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm happy to entertain any questions. Floor is open. Anybody have any questions for Roberto? Just Roberto, a comment, Mr. Just a comment, Mr. Chair. I want to thank Roberto because without his communication, on some of these elections and so on, we wouldn't have been notified in time. So I really appreciate him reaching out and making sure that we know what's going on at all times. Thank you. Good, jump, jump in, Dave. Thank you. Yeah, Roberto, I just want to give you an update. We did receive communication from the city regarding those municipal code uh, updates and uh, we gave our affirmative uh, to go ahead and move forward with that process. That being said, is there anything else I need to do uh, going forward or just wait for those municipal code changes? I think just wait for the municipal code changes. I'm sure if there's anything that is on your side, the city clerk will let you know, but we will keep a close tab with the city clerk to let you know as well if there's anything that needs to happen from your side. Thank you, Dave, for the update. Thank you. And then I may have missed it when you gave your other update. I know you're still closed, but now you're staffing the office. How would our members get in touch? Is it still just the email? Are we doing appointments yet? It, it, we're doing appointments. Uh, we actually have reached out. I think we uh, some of that information is actually in the newsletter going out uh, this week. Uh, but yes, they can they can call the office. We actually now have a member staff 
at the front desk. So when they call, they can get someone directly right away or they can contact us by email. Thank you, I appreciate it. Okay, very well. Any other uh, questions for Roberto? Uh, if not, for those of you out there in video land, uh, that was item 4A. Uh, our CEO Roberto's report. Item 4B was taken out of order just before Roberto's report. Item 4B was Pam Foley, our council uh, member liaison. And then next would be item 4C, um, Chiron's report, but we took that alongside item 3A. So we're on to item 4D, uh, discussion and action on 2022 scheduled board and standing committee meetings. Roberto, you want to take that one? Yeah, that's pretty straightforward. Staff actually works on uh, asking your board to take action on your schedule, uh, board and committee meetings for 2022. And what you see in the attachment is uh, your board meetings are always scheduled for the first Thursday of the month, except for the month of July. So that's what you see. And standing committees, which are your disability, uh, audit, um, investment, they depending they're either every other month, every month or every quarter. So you see that there as well. Uh, the only comment I wanted to add is um, again, just like this year, 2021, 2022, September will have five Thursdays. Right now you uh, board meeting for the Thursday, first Thursday of 2022 in September is scheduled for that first Thursday. If anything changes, and we made the same change that we made this year that we move it up to the second Thursday, we can do that closer to the summer. But at this point, uh, it, the meeting has been scheduled for your first Thursday of the month. So uh, with that, I, um, I will entertain any questions, answer any questions, and uh, we'll recommend to uh, approve the, uh, the schedule as presented. Uh, before I before we merge, so you, you wanna vote um, on this? Yes, please. Uh, floor is open. Anybody can't make any of the dates or have any issues? The motion by Santos to accept that. I have a motion by Santos to accept the calendar. Do I have a second? Gardner, second. I have a second by Gardner. Let's go around for the vote. Andrew? Aye. Rita? Aye. Howard? Yes. Shvar? Aye. Dick? Yes. Go. Yes. Dave. Aye. And this chair lands I but I. As always, of course, things develop. You may, you know, have a medical thing or you're on vacation. These dates have proven relatively easy to change in the past. I think speaking on behalf of our own staff, if you see a change coming, you can let them know as soon as you know so that they have plenty of time to reschedule. Um Oh, this is a discussion of pros revisions the election of board officer policy. Harvey, can I ask you to take that one? Sure. Um, you know, we uh, we had this policy for electing board officers that actually uh, was quite convoluted and spanned literally four meetings of the board uh, just to get a board chair and vice chair seated in the in, for the subsequent year. Um, and we embarked upon the start of that process uh, a month, two months ago, and began to realize, some of us began to realize that this was way too convoluted. Um, and the, the key is, is we really wanna get both the board chair and the vice chair named before the end of the year um, so that they can hit the ground running as a team uh, with the January meeting. So. Long way of saying, uh, we put here a proposal uh, to um, more efficiently address the election of the board chair and vice chair. There's no reason to separate them during the process. Uh, the policy still says, you know, if one comes from one side of the dais, so to speak, uh, the other will come from the other side. Um, but putting that aside, uh, all uh, the proposal before you is uh, to have this have the nominations take place uh, at the November meeting for both positions, have the election take place at the December meeting, and then you have the change into the guard starting with the January meeting of the board. Uh, happy to answer any questions. Um, 
those of us who talked about this and worked on putting it together think that it's a much more efficient use and a less convoluted uh, approach, uh, make it a lot easier for the board to proceed with getting its officers in place for the subsequent year. Uh, thanks, Mark. Santos to accept. <laughs> well, hang on. Okay. Um, yeah, that's good. Do I have a second to Santos' uh, motion? Second by Howard. Second by uh, Lee. Floor is open. Any questions or comments about this change? I think we'll vote on it. Andrew? Pizza. Hi. Uh, Howard? Yes. Ashvar? Aye. Dick? Yes. Franco? Aye. Dave? Aye. Bill Anson, I vote aye. Uh, so on to the actual nomination. So I, the reason I, I started there for a minute, Harvey, I was nominated to stay as chair last month. Does that need to be redone or does that stand? Ted, I, you just need to be just acknowledge that that nomination has already taken place, and um, you know whoever wants it, it, it. Now that we have a new policy in place effective today, uh, oh. then just for the record, somebody should, if they wish, uh, to nominate uh, Chair Alonza for another year, um, and uh, we can do that today. There's no, it's not a vote; it's just somebody needs to say. The nomination that we made before is now effective under the new policy. I nominate Drew Lanza for chair. Thank you very much, Dick. I will accept. Uh, the floor is open for nominations for chair or vice chair. Do we have other names to throw into the mix? Uh, Andrew, are you willing to serve again as uh, the vice chair? Yeah, I'll be happy to serve. Uh, I nominate for Mr. Garnier for vice chair. <laughs> Great. We have a nomination for Lanza to chair and Gardner to vice chair. Any other nominations? Uh, do you want to say a few words, Andrew? Uh, no, I, I would uh, be happy to serve another uh, year as vice chair and looking for another uh, great year. I would love to serve with you, Andrew. You've been a spectacular vice chair. Uh, nominations are closed, and we will vote at our December meeting. That's it, right, Harvey? You may yep, you got it. Um, Maytag, over to you for item 4G on uh, California Assembly Bill 361. So you guys know the drill. We've, we've done this about two times around. But I will say uh, for this is that for the last two votes so far, we've uh, or the last two uh, motions we've had to carry us through teleconferencing have been based on the city's resolution uh, recommending um, and imposing social distancing in city facilities. Now, the city has renewed that resolution, which, is, which was renewed in um, October 26th. Um, recently, but there's no guarantee given that the city's now past stage two and having all the vaccinations done amongst its employees that they may or may not renew it again. So the next time we do this vote, we may be considering um, a more detailed discussion about the health risks about meeting in person or not. And so I did want to prep the board in advance about that um, in the coming months. There may be a time where we would have to justify um, in the record, why we can no longer meet in person, uh, or why we can't meet in person, um, or do some sort of hybrid of the two. Now, the materials I provided you with item 4G contain a memo. Again, the requirements to continue under the abbreviated teleconferencing procedures and not the original Brown Act teleconferencing procedures require that A, that there's an ongoing state of emergency, and either B, that so local and state officials have recommended or imposed social distancing measures or see that, the, that there's a significant risk um, to the health and safety of the attendees for the meeting. So again, if the city does not renew this resolution going in November to continue to promote social distancing within city facilities, we will need a more detailed discussion at a later time. But with those comments, I turn it back over to the chair Oh, thanks, Vatek. So we don't need to vote on this. This is you sort of warning us that may be coming, right? 
Well, I, I do think for the record, we will, we should make a vote to accept the factual findings. And the factual findings here would be that A, that there's a continuing state of emergency under the government's, I mean, the governor's uh, proclamation, and B, that the city council has recently passed a resolution to continue social distancing. Motion to uh, excellent. Santos. Uh, so moved by Santos. Lanza will second. Um, Andrew. Aye. Sunita. Aye. Howard? Yes. Schwar? Aye. Dick? Yes. Franco? Aye. Dave? Aye. And this is Chair Lanz. I vote aye. And Maytech, right? We will adjourn and then you will pick you up again as we go committee by committee, right? Uh, correct, but not adjourn this meeting. You still got more to go. No, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make sure. <laughs> Thank gang. All right, that takes us to retirements. Um, the service retirement of Raul Mayorga, fire captain, fire department, effective November 13, 2021, with 32.41 years of service. Wow. With reciprocity. And Paul W. Stam, fire engineer, fire department, effective November 27, 2021, with 25.82 years of service, also with reciprocity. I'll entertain a motion to approve those service retirements. So move, Santos. Motion by Santos. Second, Second by Governor. Uh, let's go round. Andrew. Aye. Nita. Aye. Howard. Yes. Uh, Eshvar. Aye. Dick. Yes. Franco. Aye. Dave. Aye. Lanza, I vote aye. Anybody want to say anything about those uh, two gentlemen? Yeah, I'll make a comment. Uh, I always want to thank uh, both of them um, for, for the years of service, uh, you know, to the community and and for what you've done for the department. Um, they'll be missed. Enjoy your retirement. From Santos, thank you for your service. Appreciate it. Thank you, gentlemen. All right, we have a deferred vested Jeffrey Scott, police officer, police department, effective November 19, twenty twenty one, with twenty five point four years of service with reciprocity. I'll entertain a motion to approve. So move, Santos. Motion by Santos, do I have a second? Second, Wilson. A second, Dave, Dave seconds. All right, let's go around, Andrew. Aye. Anita. Aye. Howard? Yes. Spar. Aye. Dick? Yes. Franco? Aye. And Dave? Aye. Carolines, I vote aye as well. I'll never read off from. Um, the deaths of some of our members, and then we'll have a moment of silence. Notification of death of Wayne Chap, fire engineer, retired March 4th, 2000, died August 3rd, 2021. Survivorship benefits to Janie Chap's spouse. The death of Clyde Henry, fire captain, retired March 3rd, 1994, died August 17th, 2021. Survivor ben survivorship benefits to Elaine Henry, spouse. The death of Juan Emreas, police officer, retired August 6, 2009, died July 28, 2021. Survivorship benefits to Yolanda Reyes, spouse. Notification of the death of Paul E. Schmidt, police officer, retired January 15, 1994, died August 25, 2021. Survivorship benefits to Carol Schmidt, spouse. And notification of death of Melesio Ubarre, police officer, active, died August 7, 2021. Survivorship benefits to Crystal Flores, Kai Ubarre, and Cruz Ubarre, spouse and children, respectively. That's a lot of widows. When we send you our best regards, we'll not have a moment of silence. Thank you. Uh, any of you want to say, make any comments about these folks? Yeah, this is uh, Dave. Uh, comment on uh, Juan Reyes first. He was a great guy, worked here for a long time, gave a lot to the community and the department, and he is definitely going to be sorely missed. Um, I did not know Mr. Schmidt. However, he had a long retirement, and God bless him, and, and condolences to his spouse, and may, may she move on. Uh, Mel was a friend of mine. I worked very closely with him. He worked for me for a couple shifts. His was more of a, a tragic accident. Um, while he was celebrating his 50th in Hawaii. And it, he's been a tough one to, uh, to deal with, um, but prayers for uh, his wife and his kids. And uh, a thank you to Roberto. He's been helping us work hand in hand with getting all their survivorship benefits. 
Any other comments? Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, it's always sad to hear all of them uh, gave their lives for the citizens of San Jose. They did a great job. Uh, Wayne Chap, of course, the engineer, too young. Clyde Henry was a legend. Uh, it, 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 it hurts more when you work with somebody for years than I did with Clyde Henry. But to all their families, uh, thank you and I wish you nothing but the best. Peace and love. Thank you. Any other comments? Drew, it's just me. I just want to, I mean, Mr. Wilson is correct, but it, I really haven't done anything. I mean, that's been the staff. As soon as he reaches out to me, I, I reach out to staff and, and they're really doing all the work in the background and in fact, in communication with Ms. Flores. So, you know, I, I just want to thank you, Dave, but it's really the staff that gets the work done. So I just wanted to, to um, call the staff because they are the one, that, you know, uh, making and uh, taking the detailed work and uh, helping our members. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Roberto. Um, on to the committee reports um, investment committee. Yeah, um, nothing. We didn't have a meeting, Drew, so nothing to report. Uh, great. Uh, let me notice. Uh, let me note that next meeting. Um, wait, that's what next meeting. November. Meeting in November. Uh, oh, of course, the next was the meetings at the end of this meeting. Sorry about that. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, I got confused too. Um, okay, audit risk committee. Anything to report? Uh, yeah, I, we had one meeting since we met last on October 21st was a joint meeting um, with Federated. Uh, we had three agenda items. Uh, one was an update on the city auditor's recommendations, a status update, and it seems like everything was tracking there. And uh, the, uh, the 2021 auditor report from Grant Thornton was clean. Uh, I think it wasn't absolutely final, but it was almost final. Uh, and the last thing was uh, the approval of the annual report, which I actually thought was a fantastic piece of document. I've actually requested Linda for a hard copy, um, but I, I, think, I believe it's attached to this meeting as well, uh, was, uh, was the third agenda item. Roberto or Howard, did I miss anything? Uh, no, you, you didn't. Uh, you did an excellent job uh, as, as the chair for the committee. Uh, thank you so much, Sunita. Uh, the board can actually receive and file uh, items B, C, and D. And I think uh, we do have our accounting manager available in case there are any specific questions. But as Sunita indicated, um, Grant Thornton D percent E, the F is the actual offer or the actual report uh, is available as well. And um, as Sunita indicated, it's a, as usual, it's a clean opinion of their audit. Uh, so. Uh, big kudos to staff for a job uh, well done. Uh, this is the second year. Staff reminded me that this is the second year that they have done this work and the audit with Brad Thornton uh, virtually, and they have done an excellent job. So again, I just want to call uh, publicly for the uh, great work, not only Grant Thornton, but the staff, which is really led by the accounting group and the accounting manager, but it's really involve the whole office uh, because there's, uh, there's a lot of different parts of the report. So great job, everyone. Uh, again, bottom line is, is, a, is a clean opinion on a qualifying opinion of the, of the financial statements. And we're happy to answer any specific questions if there are any. Let's go ahead and, and do this uh, by the alphabet as Roberto suggested. Thank you um, for your report 7.2A, Sunita. Point two B are the minutes we receive in file of August 19, 2021. There's also a quarterly travel and attendance report. We've received those and are filing them. And um, there's an update on the city auditor's recommendations to us. We received and filed those. That was 4D. So 4D is discussion and action regarding the committee's recommendation to accept um, the auditor's report. Are there any questions about item 4E? We have staff here to answer them if there are. Yeah, and I, I let me add, uh, Mr. Chair, that the committee did uh, take action on E and F, and they did approve both the report and the actual uh, annual comprehensive financial report. So, um, just wanted to make that point: the, the committee it, it is it is recommending approval. So, we, we you want us to ratify those, right? Yes, yes, as a board, okay. both E and F. Yes, sir. Okay, well, um, are there any questions? Let's say both the same. Well, same one time. Any questions about um, the report for E? 
Uh, if not, I'll move that we approve that um, in line with the um, audit committee's approval of it. Do I have a second? Second by Santos. Great. Let's go around. I'm Andrew. Aye. Sunita. Aye. Howard. Yes. Schwar. Aye. Dick. Yes. Franco. Aye. Dave. Aye. Chair Lanz, I vote aye as well. As and for F um, is our CAFR. Um, I echo what Roberto said. We've won awards in the past. We, the staff, you guys do a great job on the CAFR. I actually kind of keep it, I always keep a copy handy on my desktop. It's kind of a Bible. Um, it's it's super handy. Um, floor's open. Any questions on the CAFR? If not, I'll, I'll move that we approve the CAFR in line with the um, prior approval by the audit committee to accept it. Is there a second to that? Motion? Second by Santos. Thank you. Motion by Lanz, a second by Santos. Go around, Andrew. Aye. Sunita. Aye. Howard. Yes. Schwar. Aye. Dick. Yes. Franco. Aye. And Dave. Aye. Chair Lanz, I aye as well. Uh, 7.3 governance committed. Anything right. to report? I think that's me. I don't, I don't think we had anything to report from that, but I'll defer to Roberto. I mean, I don't really remember what happened. That is true, life. Franco. We haven't had a meeting. We do have the special meeting after this meeting, like anybody else, but we do also have a meeting on a recommendation by city council, which we have some uh, latest developments that council is going to share with us. Uh, that's about it. Thank you, Franco. Great. Um, on the disability committee, Dick, anything to report? So let me uh, understand this. We're going to have a, another special disability committee meeting after this. This one, is that correct? Uh, immediately after, very quick. Yeah. Okay, so you see what you got in front of you. It says the last time we met was October 12th. The next meeting, November 4th, we're having that. But the next disability actual meeting uh, to review applicants will be December 6th at 10 o'clock. Great. Thanks, Dick. Um, let me note for the record that we received and filed the minutes from our September 7th meeting, and we received and filed the uh, dashboard reports, which is how we track the funnel um, of applicants um, coming through. Drew, um, go ahead. Drew, I got a question for uh, uh, Dick um, or Ann Roberto. Um, if for the December meeting, is the new um, uh, uh, doctor on board? Um, or are we still in the process of contracts? We, we still in the process. Oh, yes. We still in the process, uh, uh, Vice Chair Gardenier, but I am going to ask Barbara to comment because she's working closer to uh, this process. Barbara, do you have any updates? Yeah, we've got um, the contract finalized. Um, it's off for signature. Uh, and then we just need to get the insurances and, and backup um documentation like that and then we would be um ready to begin work and and, and start the transition so, so when do you think that transition will start taking place uh later this year or we're talking about early 22 uh i would expect later this year in fact i would expect just in a, in a matter of weeks okay thank you any other questions uh for disability committee uh if not um uh, joint JPC, uh, Andrew, you want to say anything? I know we have a meeting coming up, we, right? Mr. Chair, yeah, I, I obviously we haven't met in a long time. I believe, correct me if I'm mistaken, you all receive, all of you that are members of the committee, a, a survey from staff about a possible meeting the second week in December. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I think so. I'm looking, I think it's already been scheduled. I'm looking on my okay, calendar. Okay, so uh, as soon as we we get, uh, Linda, I know you're there. Uh, once we get all everyone's responses and the data, we'll, we'll reach out with an actual time and day for the meeting. But right now, I think we were considering the second week in December. Is that right, Linda? Yes, that's correct. Is it is it on the calendar, Linda? Not yet, because I don't oh. think that... Oh, oh, Linda, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Know. I'm sorry. It's still in any... survey form, so we're waiting for all the dates. I, I just um, need to hear from everyone. 
Yes. Who are you? Okay, so how many trustees are you still waiting from? Four trustees. Four trustees. Okay, so as soon as we get everyone back, Drew, we'll we'll issue uh, the time and day for the meeting. Hey, Linda, I'm showing an ad hoc committee meeting. Um, excuse me, board, while I straighten up my calendar, November sixteenth at ten a.m. But it looks like a JPC meeting, but it's called an ad hoc committee meeting. No, I I'd asked uh, Ellen to send it, so Linda probably doesn't know about that meeting. This is the okay. smaller. This is the subcommittee. Uh, where Vince and Elaine, uh, which is a, a subcommittee of the JPC, and I'd sent, uh, I'd asked Ellen to send you an invite, and I'd sent you a note asking if you had time to just drop in at that meeting. Ah, this rings a bell. Thanks for that. That rang a bell to me. I couldn't quite remember. Um, sort of got a I sort of got a battleful promotion here under that committee. Um, so no, nothing else to report from the JPC, Andrew? We're good to go? Good to go. Yeah, good to go. Uh, anybody have any agenda items they want to suggest for our next meeting? No, Drew, to the chair, just want to make a comment. I want to thank uh, you and, and uh, Andrew Garnier for doing a, a great job along with our staff and all our board members. Thank you for a, a great uh, time that you've served this, this last year and during these challenges times. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dick. That means a lot to uh, me and I, I'm sure to Andrew as well. Any public comments? If not, we're going to adjourn. Can I turn it over to you, Maytac? Sure. Give me just one second. Okay, so we've got the um, next meeting up for the Special Investments Committee to do the AB 360 or 361 um, factual findings. So if staff can pull up the agenda for that. We're gonna start at the investment committee? Uh, yes, but I think the, uh, we, we should get the agenda up. 